You're listening to the Multiverse Fancast, proud member of the Misfit Faction Media Network. All right, then. On with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Multiverse Fancast. If you guys are listening to us on the go, you can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, basically anywhere you guys get your podcast. You can also find more of our content on our website, themisfitfaction.com. There you find links to not only this show, but also our other shows like Cinematic Adventures and MF Uncensored, as well as links to our Misfit store for your Misfit swag and to our Misfit corner where you can read all sorts of reviews and articles. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Paul. With me in the studio today is Rob. Rob, how are you today? As always, I am here with you and I love you. That is weird. <laughs> All right, then. And tuning in via the... <laughs> he doesn't know how to recover from that. <laughs> uh, we always knew. We just didn't talk about it. Right. Tuning in from the Zoom studio is a blind bat 8719 himself, Mr. Brendan. Brendan, how are you today? I am doing well, Rob. Uh, Paul, sorry. I'm totally out of it, apparently. This I, is I, going I, I, I even great. I eight hours of sleep last night. I don't believe it. What did I forget? The kid, I, the kid was asleep. I don't know why I'm screwing. Paul, I'm doing very well. How are you? <laughs> well, I'm debating on how much I'm going to edit of this episode already, but I'm doing all right. So this is an episode that I was actually excited for. This yes. is one that I've wanted to do for quite some time. We haven't done a character study in no. quite some time. I, I don't even. I think the last one we might have done was the Hulk. I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, oh, and that's, that o- that's only aged better, that episode, and not the Hulk, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm a completely different person, literally. Oh, my God. Oh, we're fine now. We're, we're, he sent me a haiku. <laughs> but anyway, we are tackling a character that has become exceptionally popular in more recent years, who's who's been around for quite some time, but is really starting to get his, his time in the sun. Is it Joanna Constantine? I will punch you <laughs> in the face. In <laughs> the face. Too soon, too soon, Rob. Face. No, we are talking about the original, the one and only John Constantine, or the, also known as the Hellblazer. So we're going to talk a little bit about mostly his appearances in, in other media, how he's been kind of revitalized in more recent years, how the fans brought him back from a canceled show. Yeah. And really what spurned this was they announced that Constantine 2 with Keanu Reeves is in the works. Yeah, Ooh. and I think that's kind of what's the push and the impetus for this show too and everything yeah and you know what we just did our Sandman episode where Joanna Constantine or Constantine Constantine is was a character that was in only the one episode and they they show the the Constantine backstory the New Haven and all that stuff so we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, kind of get thoughts from everybody sweet all right so initial thoughts on John Constantine Rob he is someone that I think Four years ago, maybe five years ago, I no, nah, probably four years ago, I knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. I knew he had a canceled television show. It was, I know, a Keanu Reeves movie where I felt like that was the definitive Constantine because I didn't know anything about him. And then I, I read some of the Swamp Thing stuff where he was introduced. I read some of his Hellblazer stuff, and I realized just kind of how cool he is. That he, one of my students described it as because I actually spent. You'll be pleased to hear this. We spent a class period studying John Constantine. I love it. And they didn't know too much about him. And one of them described John Constantine as sort of DC's answer to Doctor Strange. Which, that's fair. That's, that's, that's a, a very fair assessment. Yeah. I mean, he is he is a bit more evilish in terms of dealing with demons and everything. But he is sort of like the magic person of the DC universe that can do spells and stuff like that. So I really appreciated that person's, I think that was Roberto, that that person's take on John Constantine. He is interesting. I'm a sucker for the anti-hero the sort of it's like all right, and this is going all the way back to like Philip Marlowe uh, and Dashiell Hammett, you know, from back in the '30s, and and Humphrey Bogart's you know dilapidated detective, where you know he's a drunkard, he is not good at his job, he uh, he's a det- the detective who with, with the dame that walks in and tries to solve the crime, but he's like a his personal life is a mess and everything, and and I love that about Constantine that he is he's a tortured soul, but he's interesting to watch, and he's clearly very talented so i i am a big fan brendan thoughts on initial thoughts on john constantine he was a he was right up there with preacher as the scary comic book that i'm probably too young to read when i saw that in the stores because those now all right i'm gonna scary i'm gonna stop you there have you read preacher yes i have you know how obscene that is then yeah 
it like preacher is is great and there i guess there's some scary things to it but it is no, mostly i'm not re- saying the stories are scary i'm saying those covers were really freaky oh you see yes. the cover art yeah the those cover were art hyper is. realistic weird things were really freaky as a kid whereas john constantine is the more evil devilish stuff you know preacher is it is faith based but it is more like it's like the boys crossed with religion <laughs> oh yeah that's but again I, I, how as what i who i am as a 15 6 year old boy i'm like i'm like you know something? Oh, yeah. let me wait a little bit I'm, that's a little too freaky i'm not gonna read this right now i don't want to spend the money on it i will worry about that later on and thank you may it pack a library one of my senior students i probably read the same exact ones you did then because one of my senior students is like have you ever heard a preacher i'm like no he's like you got to read this i'll warn you it's a little you know counterculture but uh, God, and so i borrowed it from the library and i think they all came from may pack and whole Holy they, they cow! Was one my of the best graphic novel libraries wow, I've, I've been to. Really I've been living in library since I've been moving around, and they have been the best one. Yeah, everything. Honestly. Every time I borrow something physical, it always comes from Mayapak Library when it, from their comics. Yeah, but yeah. So outside of that, that besides the, the scariness bit, I did see the movie back when it first came out, and I think, and I've seen a few things yeah. since then, but. I think the character's kind of cool. I think the whole Matt, like he makes you like that lore of like what, what secret knowledge does he have? I want to know what that secret knowledge is, despite what the clearly what the costs are to using all that magic. And I think he he's very much a case of somebody who's trying to do a good thing, mm-hmm. and but also very much tries to tell people that there's a cost to magic. But after having making one big mistake, has learned there's a big cost to magic, and I think that's a great take with his version or the DC's version. Or more like his version of magic in the DC universe. Yeah. I have a question to ask, Paul. Yes. Have we ever gotten a John Constantine origin story? Like, w- w- like you know, as a kid, he did. Oh the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. Oh yeah, John Constantine has a terrible childhood. Okay, because I don't. I I will say we haven't. Like, I there's there hasn't been from what I've seen like a John. You know, oh, like, you're talking about in medium. Yeah, yeah. They really the the most you get from John's child like his origin is the stuff that happens in in Newcastle. Okay. So okay. let's because let, I think I always appreciated that that John Constantine always came kind of fully formed and he you know we don't have like you know the Iron Man or origin story. And the the Thor origin story and the Doctor, you know, like he's always he just was. Yeah, it wasn't until like so he started off as a supporting character in Swamp Thing yes. before getting in 1985. So is, is he a creation of Alan Moore? Yes. Oh wow. And okay. there, there's a story there too. Apparently, this is a fun fact from the fanny pack. Oh yeah, I'll Alan it in there. Moore claims that he has met the real life John Constantine on two separate Ooh. occasions. I've heard <laughs> that. He, one was, I think, one was at like a con- not a convention, but in a public place. And then there was one where he claims that John Constantine sat down next to him in a bar. See, I would believe the he met the real Papa in Midnight because that there's there's lots of people like that. Really, he he's talking. Alan about- Moore claims to have met this creation on two occasions, and he told this to, <laughs> in an interview to Wizard Magazine in 1993. Um, this was after the interesting. He was sitting in a sandwich bar in Win- Westminster in London. And all of a sudden, he looks up and he and down the stairs comes John Constantine wearing the the trench coat, haircut, and yeah, he looked uh, just like Sting, which is who uh, John Constantine yeah. was based off of. Then he had claims he had a second meeting, and this was illustrated in 2001: Snakes and Ladders. And years later, in another place, he steps out of the dark and speaks to me. He whispers, "I'll tell you the ultimate secret of magic. Any see you next Tuesday can do it." <laughs> I don't want to say the actual word. Yeah, but yeah, so. Alan Moore's claimed that he has met John Constantine in real life okay. on two right. separate that occasions. That is awesome. So, I, I'm not going to put it past him. All right. Really, though, the biggest things that we learn about John Constantine is he, in his youth, his whole family was connected to magic, always. Mm-hmm. And his mother died giving birth to him. So sure. his father was exceptionally abusive, called him Killer. That was his mm-hmm. nickname for him. Mm-hmm. Such fraternal love. But so John developed a very strong addiction and affinity to magic very young. Okay. And he was in a band called Mucus Membrane. Oh. Yum. Yeah, that was the name of his band. That's so London. It's it's so <laughs> London. It was a London punk band. Yeah. yeah, so one of the first acts of magic that he ever did was to hide all of his childhood innocence and vulnerability into a box to rid himself of it. Okay. That's how, Whoa. like, how much he hated his life. But yeah, he... Became involved in the occult, and he would travel around the world, and, and he he became friends with characters like Satana, he has a long history with. We had Chaz, who was played by Shia LaBeouf in the movie. Mm. Yeah. One of the best scenes is watching him get his, like, 
neck shattered. See, this is Taz this is, is the other uh, taxi driver, right? Right. Yeah, this is before Shia LaBeouf really became annoying. Yeah, this is like right when. Yeah, I, I could, he was tolerable at this point. Yes. So he ends up trying to help. In most most iterations of the character, he tries to help defeat a demon, right. and in his pride and hubris decides, I'm just going to summon a more powerful demon okay. to do my bidding and beat this other demon. Sometimes it's a it's an exorcism gone wrong where he summons like a demon to take the other demon away, but it always involves his closest friends and, unfortunately, a young girl named Astra. And in the process, everybody gets mass- massacred and Astra gets taken to hell. And mm. I believe the demon is... Nergal is the name of the demon. Okay. And... The, that's one of the best things about the show. The show starts off there. Like, John... The, the NBC show. The NBC right. show. So, let's start... Uh, do we want to start with oh, the movie yeah. or with the show? You're the host. No, no. Let's do the movie first, because yeah. the movie doesn't talk a lot about John Constantine. Like, they do a little bit, but it's very different. Yeah, they in the movie, they the reason he's going to hell is because he committed suicide at one point, but then came back. Yes. Yeah, so, John Constantine in that... They play around with angels and demons very differently yeah. in that movie where yeah. they're they're actually called half breeds. Yes. Full-blooded demons and angels cannot actually go onto earth. So they have like these emissaries that, you know, the the half angels wear have wings that people can see and then mm. the demons are all corrupted face-wise. And Constantine is able to see through the veil. Mm. Like he sees all these creatures as they are. And as a, as a child it's terrifying. And what he says something he's like people tell you you're crazy enough you start to believe them. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. like, they do shots of him getting electroshock and, and trying to figure out what's going on. And eventually, when he was about 15 or 16, he kills himself. Or he tries to. Yeah. And he's actually brought back to life yeah, by the and paramedics. It, and it's a very Catholic sensibility of uh, belief where when you commit suicide, that's it. You're damned. It's the ultimate mortal sin. Yeah. Yeah. So, And I should say, oh, well, I have to honor my mother. It's also so an orthodoxy kind of belief, right. too. <laughs> Now, the Keanu Reeves movie took a lot of liberties with the character. So, in the comics, John Constantine has a very distinct look, he has a very distinct style, and he is one of the most powerful sorcerers in the DC universe. And that that's a big pantheon nowadays. You have characters like Dr. Fate, Zatanna mm-hmm. Satara, like, you have some very powerful magic users, but John Constantine has always been considered one of, if not the most powerful. He's worn the, fel- the helmet of fate. He's not somebody that people trifle with. Even He's even been able to pull the wool over Batman and Superman's eyes, which is like, <laughs> can, can you say you tricked Batman? Like, Ooh. yeah. So, but he's also unique in that he does not like to use magic. He actually relies on his cunning and his charm and his wit and all these other things before. Mm. Magic is always the last resort for him, which I find interesting. Especially- yeah, I, I do like the scenes when Keanu is like, I hate this part. And it's right when he's about to do magic or something. It like always that. looks like it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, or painful or, or something or awkward. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but John- well, like we say, like I was saying before, like he, he understands that there's a cost with magic and that's what – I think, again, going back to that uh, – Newcastle with the loss of the child, maybe the cost isn't always what you intended, but there's right. always a cost to use magic. Is I don't really remember a lot of the magic scenes from because, but again, the idea there's a scene where he's trying to summon something with the tattoos on his arms. Oh, yeah, you that's see, really like cool. this force when that's resisting his arm to the light, and like you see that. And I thought, like, wow, yeah, yeah. what a cool scene that was, though. There's that a was. deleted scene too. I don't know if you've, you've seen any. I, I, I was deep diving on YouTube yesterday and I found all the deleted scenes with the Francis Lawrence commentary over it. And there was a scene where he goes into the bowling alley in the back right after his friend dies from all the bugs. And he tries to summon that demon into the light, but he's too sick to do it. So he can't. And they decided to cut that scene because it just looked like that he wasn't powerful enough and it it didn't resonate back to his cancer. Right. I, I, I can understand that. That's actually a solid cut. But yeah, in the Constantine movie, he does not use magic very often. He uses, he uses it in a He uses of magical scenes. element. He uses magical props. Magical artifacts, yes. <laughs> like okay. he, he has the Shroud of Moses that he lights to scare off all the demons. And he actually like has to put it out yeah. afterwards. He's like, oh my God. He's got that little <laughs> like boxed insect or something that like, makes a noise. Yeah. You know, Beeman, he, his friend Beeman, Beeman. Brings, him, brings him all the stuff the dragon's breath. The dragon's and all that breath. Stuff. Does it so, have a special crossbow as well of holy arrows or something? He, it's it's a sh- I, like a shotgun, but it looks like a cross. So I oh, I, I, I rewatched the movie yesterday. I said this on the other podcast, and I still don't understand what exactly that gun is. I like what Shia LaBeouf's character is making those bullets, and 
I don't know why. They're holy bullets. They're holy, but what makes them holy? <laughs> they made prayer? holes in demons. I see that. <laughs> well, I liked how they do. They they make it seem like they have to do the holy water first because mm-hmm. otherwise the bullets won't even do anything. Right. They they don't make it very clear how to kill demons in this. I do love the, one of my favorite scenes though is when he's trying to convince the demon that he's actually going to fix his soul and send him to heaven. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh-huh. what's his name from the band Balthazar. Balthazar is a demon. Damn it! I'll look. He's, he's gonna drive you crazy. Yeah. But sings glycerin. What's the band that sings glycerin? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, oh, frick, glycerin. Great. This is great podcast material we got here. I'm not cutting any of this out. I'm leaving it in forever. <laughs> but I'll keep talking in the meantime. But this movie did a lot of things right. Like I love Papa Midnight. Who is? D- D- I'll, do you want me to say his name? Yeah. G- Dijon Hinsu. Yes. <laughs> One of his first comic book roles, and not certainly not his last. Oh, holy cow! But and also, like you said, I liked Shia LaBeouf. I didn't have a problem with this. Excuse ca- me. So, Rob, the band you're looking for is Bush. Thank you, Bush. Yes, the lead singer of Bush. He plays Balthazar in this. He's so swarmy. He's great. Like, who it. knew that he he had that kind of acting in him? We also have our first appearance of the DC version of Lucifer, Gavin mm-hmm. Rosdale. That's right. He yeah, stole the scene in that bit. That was a, he was. Oh, that's great. a great scene. The, the uh, one of the best lines that. we had and there was like John's trying to smoke a cigarette but he can't because his wrists are kind of cut so he's having the devil oh like, yeah do you mind if I smoke he's like no I have stock oh, it's, it's such a great line that whole scene is fantastic because uh, there's the shot of so basically they established in continuity in this movie is that when you die time stops yeah so two, he even says like two minutes in hell was all I, it's was a like lifetime was a for lifetime me. so as he he you know, spoilers for Constantine. I guess he's trying to two thousand five trying to summon Lucifer to stop the his son, and he cuts his wrists, like Brandon mentioned. And the music is swelling, and like Gabriel's in the other room, ready to like kill Rachel Weiss because she's not coming back for the Mummy Three. And <laughs> the music is just fantastic, and the the watch is progressively ticking slower and slower as the blood's going down, and then. Lucifer drops down, which was, I thought, a very unique creative yeah. choice. Yeah, I know they debated it, yes. about how exactly Lucifer should look, and they ended up going with the all-white sort. Because I, I read this, that they originally wanted Lucifer to be bare-chested, bikerish with a stud collar. Of course. <laughs> Why not? I, th- I think they made the right choice. Yeah. And I think it was a really cool – and like – it showed how powerful he really was when he like he blasts off Gabriel's wings. That that was a scene that I didn't really understand at first. Like when Gabriel goes to punch him and then just stops. And goes it, to punch Lucifer. Oh Lucifer. right, right, right. And you're like, oh yeah. And then he's like, it looks like someone doesn't. Oh, because I, it took me a minute to figure this yep. out too. Yeah, I get the confusion. So Gabriel starts going with, oh Lucifer, I'm here to help you. And then he like tries to switch it of like, oh, I'm going to sm- smote you or whatever. Well, look, God, look at what I'm doing. And then when he tries to punch, it doesn't happen. And he says, looks like someone doesn't have your back because he was doing it. Gabriel was trying to do it with the blessing of God, but God just didn't come through for him. No. <laughs> Sucks. Did you know that there's an end credit scene to this movie? Yes. I never knew that until last night. There's an end, cre- there's an end credit scene where a Constantine puts his lighter on ch- coffin. Or excuse me, Grave. Head- headstone. Headstone. And he turns around, and there's Chaz as an angel. Yeah. And he flies up into heaven. Oh, that's I, nice. Yeah, last night I, like, accidentally came across yeah. it. I'm like, how did I miss this all these years? You know what I... I thought it was the gum scene. That was it. You yeah. know, chewing the gum instead of smoking the cigarette. <laughs> One thing in this movie that I, I liked, but it was so anti-Constantine, was how it looked like they were always going to make out him and Rachel Wise, but then they just don't. Okay, I, I read something about this, actually, that they, uh, unless this is where you were going no, and no, I'm no, stealing no, no. it from you, that they didn't want to dr- put in that element into the thing because they, they liked the character of Constantine being sort of a loner. And so they actually... Rachel Weiss and Keanu Reeves made sure that they never kissed because they were afraid that the studio would take that footage and somehow incorporate it into the film in terms of a romantic angle. Right. There's actually, did you notice Michelle Monaghan? Yeah. Did you know, do you know anything about her? She was a character from the comics that actually had a relationship with John uh-huh. Constantine. I, for, I forget the name of the character. I, but... I do too. Michelle Monaghan is, she shows up at the very end. Holy water. Holy water. And that's her only line. She is an entirely cut plot line from the movie. She had a bunch of other scenes. That yeah. Apparently she she was has in. a scene where apparently she is his booty call. And they have a scene with John Constantine getting out of bed with her and getting dressed. And she's talking. And they felt that it, 
made Constantine look less alone. Right. Like that it, cause he's a loner. He's, he's, I'm a loner, Dottie. I'm a rebel. And this one's empathize. Like it, it just softened him too much. So they bit. cut him completely. So there are two defining characteristics of John Constantine mm-hmm. in the comics. One, he is a whore. John Constantine has slept with so many people. And I'm I'm glad you said people. Because John Constantine is also a bisexual. He is gender fluid. Which I find I find interesting because it was at a time where that was not popular. Like he right. they announced that he was bisexual in like ninety three. Yeah. And you think about the early nineties and stuff like that, like it, it was unheard of almost. in the show with Matt Ryan, did they address that at all? Not in the season one okay. of his actual show, but in Legends of Tomorrow they yes. did, yes. In Legends, he, he – doesn't he sleep with – what's his name with the glasses? Oh, Gary? Yeah, Gary. Yeah, supposedly. I think he has, has uh, but he, he, sl- he sleeps with Sarah Lance, too, in his first episode. Yeah. That's a great episode. <laughs> um, like, just such, such a fun episode. But uh, going back to his characteristics, the other thing about him is the people around him always die. Yeah. And that is part of, part of a curse that's been placed on him, where – the, oh. the people that he cares about most, the people that he loves, are always going to die. Mm. There's even a line where I think he was fighting like Dracula or something stupid because that's <laughs> comics. And, well, and that's Dracula is a DC character, isn't he? I think so. <laughs> Definitely a Marvel character, but I think DC also because he's public domain too. That's so like true. they can ah. kind of use him however they want. But he, he's like somebody is dead in a bed and they ask, is that a friend of yours? And he goes, must be, he's dead. <laughs> and that's just, oh. that's just the way Constantine views the world. So... I know we're not talking about the actual movie, but just really quick, if Star City rating for the Constantine movie, we'll probably do a full episode yeah, yeah, when we yeah. get closer, but just, just kind of... Um, having just come fresh off that one, I would say three and a half stars. I'm with it you. Is, you know what I love most about that film is the aesthetic. I love the color palette. I love the the feel of it, the ambiance. I love Keanu Reeves in that character. I, I think he he settles into it very well. And, and, you know, I love Matt Ryan, too. And Matt Ryan's Constantine is just something totally different. It's sort of like when America adopts British shows and right. tries to Americanize it. Sometimes they land very, very well. Like, I, from what I've heard, the new season, the show Ghosts on, I think it's NBC, is an, a British adaptation. I'm a big fan of that British show. And everyone says it's a great adaptation. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they they crash and burn. And this one is kind of like, I, I consider it a successful British adaptation. I think it is way more, I, it takes itself seriously. It's It's got great we- world building to it. Having just talked about Sandman last week, this is another kind of movie where it, there is some cool world building there. Like, yeah. you know what the rules are. You know how everyone interacts with one another. So I... I Give it. It's got its flaws because it doesn't. The pacing kind of comes and goes at times. There's plot holes, but overall three and a half. And I, I'm looking forward to Constantine two. I'm gonna give it a three and a half. Also, I, I'm gonna echo a lot of the same things you just yeah. said. I agree. Fantastic world building. You you knew everything you needed to know about John Constantine. Right. You knew exactly where. And they didn't shy away from some of the darker stuff. Him having cancer. Him chain smoking. Him suicide. Trauma. Like they they don't shy away from it. And for a time where comic book movies were still finding their footing, it was ahead of its time in that so, regard. That was something that always bothered me about Legends of the Tomorrow is that every time he had a cigarette in his hand and he went to light up, something would interrupt I, so him. I will explain that. Go in, ahead. Uh, when we, well, because we, we get don't, to the show. We don't want the kids to think that smoking is cool. Uh, now, actually, I'll give you the real reason. <laughs> oh, all right, first, Brendan's Star City rating. I would probably I, I'm gonna go, go with you guys probably might more like a three though just because I've yeah. been, honestly I didn't seen it since it first came out and I wrote a review for it way back then so mm. I I just think again the movie was fine I like the lore like you guys said yeah. and I, I I mean I do feel like what probably happened with it is that they made an action movie and they just kind of draped over some of the Constantine like here's the Constantine flavor for it mm. and that's kind of how they made movies a little bit back then with some when they licensed some properties so that's what I kind of felt happened with the Constantine movie and. I think, actually, you kind of bring it up there a little bit. We shouldn't gloss over this. This movie was 2005. This is three years before Iron the, the Iron Man, you know, the whole Marvel Universe. And actually, isn't this slight... I know it's before The Dark Knight. Isn't this before Batman Begins? 2005? So yeah, around the, I, definitely around uh, the same Probably around time. the same time. Like, so this is, like, really the only successful franchises for superheroes that have been out have been essentially the Spider-Man trilogy, Sam Raimi's, and uh, the X-Men. Yeah. So this is like really groundbreaking. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I should give props to Shaq's steel. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Set, set, yeah. The, set the groundwork. <laughs> yeah, my, my fault. Well, the, the steel work. Yeah, the steel. Uh, and we'll give a little bit of credit to Wesley Snipes' blade. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But so this is definitely in the early throes of the superhero renaissance, and it's impressive that they were able to pull it off. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, also too a little bit. I'm just glancing a little bit over on the Wikipedia page, but right, it does also have. Like the Catholicism bit, and usually religion yeah. does make something, especially when you're making it superhero ish, can get a little bit tricky or comic book ish. But like one of the things, like like, but a small thing in the film did with the lore villain that I always had a good kick out of was they're trying to do research about the Spear of Destiny, and he mentioned always oh, the Corinthians twenty chapter twenty three, and she's like, "There's no chapter twenty three of Corinthians, not in the Earth book, but in the Dip Demon version of cool. the Bible. Yeah. There's like another twenty six yeah. chapters." I, I'm I'm a sucker for a lot of as someone who was brought up with a great deal of religion in his life. I'm a sucker for all that stuff. Yeah, and and it's all based on like even the catching the Spear of Destiny in the beginning, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and they talk about it, you know. It's it's the, no, it's the thing that hit Jesus and the yep. Nazi flag that it's in. Minor complaint. Oh, hit it. As soon as Constantine starts, I don't know if you remember, they put words up on the screen about the Spear of Destiny yeah. and what it is and that it's been lost for years. I hated that so much because it just smacked of some studio exec who said, They're not I don't enough. fully understand what the Spear of Destiny is. I think we need to put some some f- words at the I hated oh, that. Oh, absolutely. That's Bringing up the Spirit of Destiny, though, I'm getting flashbacks to before this it was in his Evangelion, how that was a reference, and at times like they, had, they needed to find the Spirit of Destiny to save mankind from all the angels. But that's a whole other oh, yeah. episode of whatever of unboxing, so we're not going down that <laughs> route. All right, so let's talk about arguably one of – I will say one of my favorite superhero shows, one of my favorite superhero portrayals, and one that – after after cancellation found new life shockingly, and right. I, I remember being so excited about it at the time, and that is NBC's Constantine. Now, Constantine came out. It was one season that aired in 2015 or 2014 to 2015. They did 13 on NBC on NBC. Yeah. This week on NBC, you should see what Constantine's up to after that rerun of Friends. And then it's just people dying, <laughs> just everyone dying. Oh God! Oh God! No! No! Must see TV this Thursday night. So Matt Ryan gets a cast in the role and he is a spinning image of what John Constantine should look like. He, yeah. Like the first shot that they released was like a, a comic panel from, it was like a reenactment of a comic panel of him just standing there and he's just in the trench coat. He's got the tie. He's got the disheveled look. Like and he I, looks like, him. I looked it up. Matt Ryan really wasn't well known before this. Uh, he had like uh-huh. one or two other yeah. shows. He I was s- more stage. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw him in the Tudors. I think it was something like that. Yeah, yeah. Which I didn't really know who he was at the time. And again, I think that that always kind of helps. Yes. But so this show, let, let me first address the smoking thing. Okay. You can't show somebody actually smoking on a network television. Must see TV really? doesn't allow for network smoking. Really? <laughs> so they, in more recent years, there's been a ban on smoking. So, Older shows like Friends, you'll see it every once in a while, but most network television, they were not allowed to show smoking on TV. They could, so they could have it tucked behind their ear or something. Like but that. even in Constantine, like the show, yeah. you'd see him just putting the cigarette out, right, or stepping on it, or something along those lines, or him in a bar where there's a lot of smoke, but he's not smoking. <laughs> they found a lot of workarounds for that because it is an it yeah. is an important part of his character. Yeah, it is. So they they played around with that a lot. There are a lot of episodes. I think there's only one episode where there's actually a cigarette in because his mouth. Because network television needs to parent because parents aren't doing it. <laughs> you know, in the show about demons and possession and... Yeah. Teach the, your kids not to smoke. <laughs> then you won't get demons. <laughs> but Don't leave it up to a studio exec. So the show starts off with Constantine in a mental asylum, in Ravenscar yeah. Asylum. And like you're like, what the hell's going on? And he's basically trying to... Uh, unlearn magic like he, he he's like there's a great scene where you know the, the psychiatrist is, is like you know these things aren't real and he, he like slams the table he's like that's what you keep telling me now make yeah. me believe it right. like he's doing voluntary like this is all voluntary he's checked in there after the death of astra so the very first episode a demon actually shows up and now we've We've watched Supernatural. Yes. We've seen a lot of shows that involve demons and possession and stuff like that. Constantine did it very well. Mm. And basically, Constantine gets ambushed by a demon in there. And in the most Constantine fashion, walks up to the guy, sees he's possessed, and he goes, nope, uh-uh, nope. uh-uh, walks away, <laughs> rolls his eyes, walks back into frame, and proceeds to exercise the demon. It's very, it's very John Constantine. Yeah, I, I've seen like, I haven't watched the whole run. I, I'd like to at some point. I've seen like two episodes, I think, of it. And it's, 
it, I liked it. It seemed a little trapped by the because was it an, an hour show? Yeah, it was your typical hour. It seemed, and the yeah. fact that you said that, I, it kind of leads me to it. Yeah, it felt trapped by the typical trappings of a television network forty-two minute show, of like you know the studio exec saying, "Okay, this needs to happen by this mark," and when the commercial comes in, we need to have the character failing. Mm-hmm. Like it, it felt a little like dictated by that. Whereas Legends, I felt like allowed him to breathe a little bit. Yeah, but I they watered him down in Legends. As that too, I agree. Did. But in this show, he's. After he – basically the demon tells him that something's coming, yeah. and we find out from an angel named Manny. Played by, I believe it's Harold Perrineau yes, from Lost. Who was fantastic. And the angel yeah. effects were shockingly good. Yeah. They do some – like they do practical wings, really oh, good wow. stuff. Yeah, and he tells him that there's a rising darkness. So basically the entire show is him trying to fight off this rising darkness. And in the very first episode, he <laughs> – they have a character that they introduce in the first episode, and her name is oh, what was Liv Aberdeen. Hmm. And apparently she was supposed to be in the entire show, but oh, really? there was some sort of scheduling issue after the <laughs> pilot got picked up where they write her out completely. Yeah, that they, happens with a lot of pilots where they'll shoot it and they'll make it a certain way, and then the studios won't pick it up right away, or the studios will have notes. Yeah. So instead they uh, they cast another female lead based off the comics named Zed but the cast was fantastic and Matt Ryan knocks it out of the park with this and you know they catch a lot of like his you know he's he's like jumping out of a married woman's window when her husband shows up and then he's like practicing summoning spells totally naked and Chaz and like the girl (laughs) walk and they're like ah but like they they do such great work with him they he's a cad a cad. A cad. That's that's how I would best describe John Constantine as a cad. But we also have Angelica. Angelica? And I'm a, to... I see the accent mark over Salea, her name, so I see yeah. you struggling with her name for that reason. As, I don't know. As Zed Martin, who's a psychic that gets drawn to, literally, she's drawing pictures mm-hmm. of John Constantine. She's trying to figure out who this guy is. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, the reluctant sidekick almost. Charles Hafford as Francis Chaz. Chandler, we find out that Chaz can't die in this. So is this the Chaz supposed to be? Is the same character as Shia LaBeouf's? Yes. And in this, he. I thought they invented him for the Keanu Reeves movie. No, no, he's an actual character from the comics. Constantine's longest living friend. So what is he lasted three days? Well, in this, he dies the very first episode. Uh, And then he's brought back. And we find out throughout the course of the episodes, we do a flashback where a drunken John Constantine casts a protective spell over Chad. And then Chaz is at a bar when this is happening because yeah. John's drunk and he leaves with some floozy. And the bar burns down and everyone in there dies. Except for? All of those souls get put into Chaz. So when he dies, it's actually killing one of those souls. Uh, oh, wow. And so he'll regenerate and come back. So when Chaz comes back, you say he comes back. Comes back human? Yeah, he's still oh, totally wow. human. He's still himself, but he's got all these life forces inside of him. Okay. Like yeah. I think like at one point they count out like 72 he or something like legion, that. Yeah. So for he's many. I think he has a photo album too of all the people. No. Like just cuz he's like they all died but I got like a lot of survivor's guilt. You're clever. Yeah. But one of the best episodes cuz th- this show was not afraid to go exceptionally dark. It's one of my favorite shots, like a great superhero shot, especially you like the anti-hero. You mm-hmm. like the hero that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's it's going to be a rough go with yeah. this hero. Oh yeah, I get that. Episode four is called A Feast of Friends, okay. and he's visited by an old friend named Gary who um, accidentally brought a demon with him. And who, then Who is it? His name is Gary. Not that Gary. Rare? No, not that Gary either. But And at the end of the episode, John convinces Gary to take the demon into him and let him kill, like die, basically. Okay. A and the, the, okay. Last, the last shot, and it's fantastic, especially if you like cinematography, the last shot is Gary... In a bed in the house that they're in, yeah. screaming in agony because basically this demon is ripping him apart from the inside. And John's just sitting there holding his hand, listening to his friend die. Hmm. And then Manny the angel appears and he stands with John so that he could take his friend's soul to heaven when it's over. And it's just like, and that's how the episode ends. Hmm. Like, it is just like dark, but I was like, wow, what a what a shot, what a scene. So I'm looking at the numbers on IMDb per episode and, and like how they're rated. These numbers are off the chart. It is a fantastic uh, yeah. show. So why did it get canceled? It just didn't have NBC viewership. 
Oh. Uh, so this show, unfortunately, gets canceled, and it gets canceled on a cliffhanger, too. Uh, that was my next question. Oh, dang. Yeah, it gets canceled on a cliffhanger, and not like literally the day it got canceled, Stephen Amell from yes. Arrow went on Twitter. He said, Matt Ryan, anytime you want to come right. play in Star City or something along those lines. Yeah. And when they, when I say like they immediately got him onto that show, yes, it was like clockwork. Did and it was they awesome. ever resolve the cliffhanger? They mentioned it in Legends of Tomorrow okay. that he dealt with it, and you know they mentioned heaven and hell, but obviously they don't do a lot of the angel stuff okay. in Legends. They do a lot more of the hell stuff. That was like a whole season's worth yeah. of stuff. But it's the same. Supposedly it's the same John Constantine. It's the same. You know Matt Ryan because apparently now Tyler Hecklin Superman is not. The same Superman oh, different from different world. Yeah, <sighs> whatever. I, well, I, I said this on the Sandman thing that I think one of the strengths that DC ha- can work with right now is you know they tried to put together the DC EU. It failed horribly, miserably, awfully, and I think they can use that as a, a strength in that they don't have to connect. It's okay if it's its own story. Yeah, it's not like Marvel. You know, Marvel everything has to connect and, and fit in with one another, but it's okay if we get a you know, a, a Tyler Hecklin Superman that has nothing to do with everybody else. I'm still going to get his autograph at Comic-Con. Is he going to be there? Go the for it. You yeah. are? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm very excited. I want to get uh, a bunch of them. You're going to do the Smallville reunion? I'm going to try. It depends on the lines. Who's going with you, Mel? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But So they bring him into the Arrowverse, first on just Arrow. Right. And he helps put Sarah's, Sarah Lance's soul back into her body. Because mm-hmm. they use the Lazarus Pit to bring her back, but it doesn't bring back her soul. It just reanimates right. her body. So they then bring him into an episode of Legends, and it's fantastic. I think that might have been my first introduction to John Constantine. On Arrow? On Arrow when yeah. he brought him back. I, I don't think I really knew. And like, because I the Constantine movie, I'm like, oh, it's it's like a Matrix movie. Like, I didn't really see it as a superhero kind of thing. Supernatural Matrix. Yeah, it's Supernatural Matrix. He's, he's dodging bullets. So I think that Arrow was the first time, because we were... When, I will say that, like, when we... We were. I was always. I, I was kind of like the superhero stuff, but I wasn't really super into it. And then when Timmy was born, he loved, of course, superheroes. And the very first superhero show that he was super into was Arrow. Right. He watched everything. He wanted to be Arrow. Like he used to do all the training montages in the backyard on his playground and everything. And you know, he dressed as Arrow for Halloween. Say what you will about Arrow, about where it went and and quality. Like that's still. It was still such a solid it was show, especially so in the beginning. Awesome. So the first season was definitely. Really really good i i got hooked watching it then i wanted to do a salmon letter i can't do that yet but that was always something i wanted to do i remember getting like one of the wii games like let's play the archery game yeah. I'm, like, I'm wearing my green hoodie thinking oh i'm arrow gosh. trying yeah. to play I, this I, game. I have my green arrow cosplay yeah, yeah yeah timmy got a real cosplay outfit for it and he was like seven years old he, he we paid all out for it and he, he went around and he loved it oh yeah but yeah that was when our first saw john constantine was when he came on to put sarah lance's soul back and it, i love it because not only does he hit on all the women there, mm-hmm. but even like after he leaves, I think it was Thea who was like, so he's yummy because John Constantine has some sort of like a tr- just attraction to him that people yeah. are people are just drawn to him, men and women, which is hilarious. And I love it. But then they bring him back for Legends. And that's when they really started to to have him more involved. He became a series regular at yeah. one point, but they definitely watered him down a little. But well, Legends is also really goofy. Very goofy. Uh, it's kind of got like a Doctor Who vibe to it, which yeah. I appreciate that. I, we were into into it for quite a while. We we hung in there when it started getting into too much of the Bebo stuff and everything. We're like, they were uh, really into Bebo. Yeah, we we kind of tapped out a little bit and we never finished it. But we finished Arrow to the end, and and we loved all the Constantine stuff. But yeah, it was too much. Mm-hmm. But uh, and then uh, Brendan, I know you've watched the animated stuff. Yeah, I've been. I watched oh the Justice League Dark, which is the first time you see John Constantine, I believe, in the animated universe, and you have Matt Ryan again reprising his role. Right. And I, I think, and by this point, too, based on the the TV show with Matt Ryan, as well as him on being on Arrowverse, he is he's the character for yeah. he's the actor for that character. Like you think about with I'm gonna throw it. I forgot the Superman guy. Help me out with Tyler, it. Chris Reeves, oh, Superman, Reeves, and yeah. why he's or Christian Bale with his Batman. This is one of those people you just associate the with the character. Actor. So hearing his voice because he has that snarkiness in it. And what was really cool again, you see him do all these little magical tricks. Probably a little more so in the in the animated story of the Justice League Dark, which was really well done. Nice little twist because I had seen clips on YouTube and then like. 
watching me like oh that was really clever and but just seeing the whole aspect of this side of the dc universe and then but the whole thing with with constantine again he like you've mentioned paul before like what you like in your magic is more of this visceralness to it of like you have the incantations and you see they have these hand gestures and you're drawing out you know what elaborate diagrams of exact extract magical power mm -hmm. and constantine does all that stuff and i think too is he shows that he knows a thing or two and that's the thing part you attract you to him he apparently i was reading up has some sort of like luck power to him oh, as yeah. well that happens to get him out of some things but again, too, he also, I think what was great in the movie is they established, you know, he has a history there. He has a history with Zatanna, which for me, I was pointing out to my wife, like, it's funny. It must be awkward for her being on this mission because she's both with Constantine and Batman, who are two known exes. Imagine trying to do a job with two exes on your team. Oof, but, right. um, I got a question I, for you guys, unless I'm cutting you off. Go ahead. No, no, go right ahead. So let's let's role play this. So in eight, ten months first trailer for Constantine 2 comes out. We get our first looks at what this is, and there's Keanu, bleach blonde, brown trench coat, scruff and red tie. How do we feel? I would be okay if they forego the blonde hair yeah. for Keanu Reeves because it would just look... I, I don't think it would look good. Okay. Matt Ryan dyed his hair. He's, right. he's a natural yes. brunette. And he, he went on a lot of record going, like, I hated having to dye my hair. But, like, when I met him, he had, yeah, he had I saw the picture, hair. yeah, yeah. with the fedora. Yeah. <laughs> Still the coolest dude. Like, seriously, like, not even blowing smoke. He was just such a nice guy. Yeah. And c conventions can be weird when you're meeting the celebrities. Yeah. Sometimes it feels very rushed. He was like, yo, like, how are you? Like, I'm, thank you for coming in. What, what kind of faces do you want to do? What kind of pictures do you want? Like, he was really chill with stuff. And, like, he gave Melanie a hard time. He's like, don't be so mean to him. Like, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> having only been to one other convention or well two but one with celebrities i've they we've always been treated nicely yeah. by them they, but you hear horror them. stories sometimes yeah. like about how some of these guys, like or they're just so expensive yeah uh, apparently or was it, we, was it, oh it's the loan four hundred dollars when he was at new york comic-con yeah well, i remember that i know in london we couldn't afford to go see benedict cumberbatch well my, we saw uh, him from a distance and we waved <laughs> marty mcfly and doc brown are gonna be oh, at comic-con 250 a piece i bet yeah yeah it's like crazy. I'm, I might actually pay that. <laughs> I, we debated it, but like in all honesty, uh, five hundred dollars for the set. No thanks. Yeah, I know. But, so, um, Brendan, how would you feel if about Keanu if he came out looking like Matt Ryan? I actually would be upset. I'd rather they stick with the aesthetic yeah. that they they already established. That's my take, and I kind of hope with the movie the. I'd rather they do almost kind of like a Top Gun Maverick idea where instead of, you know, it's like you have you have him age, have him just at least be older and don't try to make this like a direct like, oh, this story is only two months after the first movie. Do something where he has some mileage on maybe like a Logan story or surprise us all and let's go fan wishing and, you know, sneak Matt Ryan in there. Actually, why not do like an Earth 2 and an Earth 5 yeah. sort of thing? I'd be OK with that, actually. I, for me, if he can if Keanu came out looking like that, I'd feel like he was Matt Ryan cosplaying. Yeah. Yeah. Give, give him the trench coat and the tie, and I'm happy. Yeah. In all honesty, like especially because I have made peace that that is a that is like an Earth Nine John okay. Constantine. I would be okay with the trench coat and tie if like he halfway through the movie had some sort of reason why he needed to change outfits or something, and that's what he put on. Well, it's funny because in in the Constantine movie, he he wears a like a long coat and, you and know, it's all a black, suit, but yeah. he, they never address it. No. Like so, I don't have a problem with him just wearing it, like yeah. and not even not even paying any mind to it. Right. One thing I do want to see in this new Constantine movie is I want to hear him doing spells. Like Brennan was just saying, I'm a big fan. Matt Ryan was very good at he their version oh, of Constantine his, yeah, mumbling of the different incantations. It yeah. wasn't even like it wasn't just Latin. Yeah. He was doing like voodoo and like he was doing all these different things and it was really cool like you know there were times where he'd like grab the dirt off the ground and right. he'd like crumple it up a certain way or like he'd eat it or something stupid like <laughs> they, they did some really interesting magic stuff with uh, john constantine and i would love 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 for them to do which i think is awesome too because it's like harry potter for example with their magic system it's all there's a set of rules that we all follow whereas i feel of constantine with what he was doing with that it shows that there's different types of magic, which I think he's done better than even the Marvels kind of Marvel's trying to show that a little bit now, but he was able to, like you were saying, oh, this is more like Caribbean magic, where there'll be more of the voodoo stuff. Oh, this is something that's a little more English, maybe ethereal, like our mm -hmm. Arthurian magic. Here's something that's a little more, you know, devil magic or you know, demon magic. Like, I like that they showed some of those different versions that he and he's well versed in a lot of that. Yeah. 
But uh, I think that's pretty much going to wrap us up on Mr. John Constantine, unless anybody else has some. What's, well, I, I want to hear some of your take on some of the uh, cartoon, uh, animated stuff. The animated stuff is fantastic. I think it, it benefits the most from the fact that it is in this Justice League continuity that starts after the Flashpoint Paradox. And it's all mm-hmm. Matt Ryan, too. It's all Matt Ryan. Yep. And it's all, you know, it's after Justice League War and Throne for Atlantis and like all these other things. So to see him interact, because Batman's really the only person from the Justice League that's involved with this team. It's him, it's Constantine, Dark Man, or Dark, Death Man? Dead Man? Dead Man, Zatana. excuse me. Dark Man. Yes. Jolie. <laughs> No, Zatanna no. Boston and Boston Rob, yeah. yeah, and the the House of Mystery has its own consciousness in it, but it's it's very interesting to see him pair. Oh, and Etrigan and the Demon, totally forgot about Etrigan. Oh, Etrigan, yeah. What is that? There's a character named Jason Blood okay. who he's kind of like a magical Hulk type character where he transforms into somebody called Etrigan the Demon. Ooh. And Etrigan the Demon also speaks in rhymes. <laughs> because that no, because that's part of the hierarchy of hell. That different demons have different ways. So a yeah, rhyming demon, which apparently was no, that's that, that's I'm referring to last week's episode with Sandman. I think that's the reference in there. But yeah, the rhyming demon's pretty high, higher in the he's a, double hierarchy, okay. demon hierarchy of the DC he's universe. He's a poetical demon, very very powerful demon. Yes, <laughs> okay. yes. But it, it was really cool. And your ass to you as he's using iambic pentameter. <laughs> I can't. There's, there's actually a scene in the movie which was kind of funny. There's these like death specters that are trying to collect. You know, somebody's about to die and whatnot. And, like they see Batman. Like this one has vexed us for a long time. He's like he can't really see them. And all he just says is "boo," and all the specters just fly away. <laughs> they were scared. Death is scared of Batman, but it, it was really cool to have him interacting. Like I said, with uh, all these other characters, and especially with Batman. And I I would love to see him in some sort of... I know they wanted to do a Justice League Dark movie. I think they wanted to do it for HBO Max, and it just Mm. fell through. But I don't know. We'll see. The future looks bright for John Constantine, luckily. Sweet. But uh, that's going to bring us towards the end. We do have a fan feedback Friday. Woohoo! This week, if you could combine two superheroes, who would they be, and what would be the new hero? All right, so from Rob's comic book class... Oh, boy. <laughs> they had some good ones. Deadpool and Thanos. Think about that. Yeah, that's terrifying <laughs> to think about. Spider-Man and Superman. Thor and the Flash. I mean, that's OP. Riddler and Superman. That's entertaining. <laughs> Hulk okay. and the Flash. Captain America and the Joker. Batman and Iron Man. They basically are yeah, the same person. That was the argument that he's essentially like just super wealthy then. Professor Xavier and Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Captain America and Wolverine. Nightcrawler and the Thing. That's a deep cut. I, I, I like that. I like that. Superman and the Silver Surfer. That'd be an interesting. I, I visually, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Quicksilver and the Flash. Super fast. Su- super fast. <laughs> Red Skull and the Joker. Plastic Man and Superman. Sandman and Hulk. Vision and Magneto. Scarlet Witch and Green Lantern. Venom and Superman. Alfred Pennyworth and Jarvis. Best Butler ever. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, Batman and Spider Man. Spider Bat. Spider Man. Spider Bat. I was better, man. <laughs> Rob, did you tell your class about the Amalgam comics when they, when this came up? No. What what is when what, what are you to what are you referring? You don't know. So the, there's a, I think a, a thing called the Amalgam comics where they I think it was a partnership with DC and Marvel where they actually combined their heroes. Yeah. Okay. And made them actually into like I wrote stories with them. So I was like, I think it was like Batman and I, Captain America. I know there's, uh, a, was, there's a Spider Hulk. No, it was Batman and Wolverine became Dark Claw. And it's the okay. most 90s thing you can imagine. Is it really? Superman yes. and Captain America were fused into okay. Super Soldier. I don't think I'm familiar at all with oh this Oh my now. god, it, it's, it was a very limited series. Spider Bo- They made Spider-Boy out of Superboy and, and the Ben Riley Spider-Man. <laughs> it, it's, Ooh, it's, it, wow. it's wild. There is, and this is something I stress to my students. For as deep as I am into comics, there is so much I don't know. Yeah, there's always more. There's a lot. There's always more. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I, I highly recommend taking a look. Just just yeah. for funsies at oh, this yeah. point. But uh, that is going to wrap us up. Don't forget, guys, if you want more of our content or to participate in Fan Feedback Friday, you can always find us on Facebook. Type in uh, the Multiverse Fancast or the Misfit Faction Media Network, and you'll find links to all of our stuff. We are also on all the social media. We are on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. Just type in the Misfit Faction Media Network, and odds are you'll find some of our material. And uh, we want to thank Brendan for jumping in. Brendan, tell people about what you do on the internet. Bl- Line bat. Yes. So I am a content creator for the Magic the Gathering card game. They have a platform called Arena that I play and record videos on on YouTube. So if you want to, if you like 
Magic the Gathering, and you'd like more, you know, specifically on my niche is the historic brawl format. If that's something you enjoy and you want to see my take on some deck ideas and how to play the game a little bit, check out my YouTube channel. Just type in BLND, B A T 8719, Blind Bat 8719, because I'm missing my eye. Not really, but that's just a joke I loved when I was a kid. And so, chum, check out, subscribe, like the videos. Have you ever done any of the Magic the Gathering stuff where I know there's a comic book place in Connecticut that does it? I think it's like the dungeon or something like that. Have you, you ever have I played in tournaments before? Yeah. Yes. And I've had to ex- exemplify that I've traveled for tournaments. I've been, oh, I've wow. been to Rhode Island twice to oh compete. Oh, my gosh. I went as far. The furthest I've traveled would be Montreal, actually. Holy cow. This is yeah. a side well, that I one was know. a little bit. That one was slightly cheaper because I didn't have to bring a deck. I just had to show up and they buy you know, it was sealed. Oh, so wow. I paid my entry fee. They gave me six packs of cards. I open it up and I build the best deck I can oh, out wow. of those six packs. You just kind of do so that even levels the playing field for everybody because you're just like you get what you get. Well, and yes, and it, that's where the skill comes in about like you know can you win with the pool that you have because some you know it's depending on the format. Some things are rare because there's a grade to how how often or the rarity of each card. If it's a bomb format where you, you have to open up really expensive cards to win, then hopefully you open that. There are some formats that's not the case. Mm-hmm. If you can, you know, the, the common cards are just as powerful. You just got to put everything the best way and you know have your game plan and. A bit too. It's an endurance thing. The uh, usually these tournaments are two round, two days. Mm. First round could be eight to ten rounds. The first day is eight to ten rounds. So, Jeez. like I remember, I would start at like nine o'clock in the morning, and the last round won't go till like eight <laughs> o'clock at night. Jeez. <laughs> You know, but Montreal I had the fond memories. It was a good time. I had a good time there, and I actually got the the night before won a qualifier, so that I had three buys the next day. So wow. the first three rounds were automatically wins for me. So I had to sleep in. <laughs> All right, then. Now that we've learned a little bit more about That's Brendan. So cool. <laughs> that is going to wrap us up. Again, thank you, Brendan, for jumping on. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, I'm Paul. I am Rob. And I'm Brendan. And we'll be back in a flash. Smokey Spoke loves.